All right. Welcome to the Take a Closer Look podcast. We got a very special guest today, someone I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, Dr. John Bergsma. For those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. John Bergsma is a professor of theology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. A former Protestant pastor, Dr. Bergsma entered the Catholic Church in 2001 while getting his PhD in Bible from the University of Notre Dame. A close collaborator of Dr. Scott Hahn, Bergsma speaks, speaks regularly on the Catholic radio and at conferences and parishes nationally and internationally. He has authored over a dozen books on scripture and the Catholic faith, including Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic, and A Catholic Introduction to Bible Old Testament. Dr. Bergsma's talks and studies are available on CD and MP3 from catholicproductions.com. He and his wife, Dawn, reside with their eight children in Steubenville, Ohio. Dr. Bergsma, something tells me you're a pretty busy guy, so I appreciate you being here to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's my pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So your book, uh, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's mm -hmm. what I want to talk to you about today. Okay. Absolutely loved it. Great. Um, it was clear, concise. It was convincing. It was really easy to read. And I've always seen the parallels between the Dead Sea Scrolls and Jesus and early Christianity. But after reading your book, I, I couldn't help but to think that there has to be an actual historical connection between the Jesus movement and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you actually hypothesize what that historical connection might be, which we'll get into. Um but can you first just give like a brief overview for those who may not be familiar? What are the Dead Sea Scrolls and why are they significant? Sure. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, to state it very quickly, are the remains of a Jewish monastic library from a what was essentially a Jewish monastery that flourished on the shores of the Dead Sea um, beginning about 150 BC and then ending around the year 70 when the, the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed. And um, why are they significant? They're significant for a number of reasons. Um, I'll name probably the two top reasons. First of all, the scrolls include uh, our oldest complete copies of uh, biblical books. So the oldest complete copy of Isaiah uh, is uh, contained in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so that is, you know, absolutely fascinating, as well as partial copies of dozens and dozens of biblical books from very ancient times. Um, so basically our oldest copies of, of the Old Testament um, uh, are, are there. And uh, secondly, um, with regard that so that's their relevance to the Old Testament. It's the oldest text of the Old Testament that we have. And then with respect to the New Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a privileged witness to the culture and worldview of Jews that were contemporaries with Jesus. Um, the, the scrolls uh, were physically copied and written and in some cases composed uh, contemporary with the lifetime of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles. Um, so, uh, and of course we have other documents from this time period, but when we're talking about the scrolls, the actual physical copies uh, were written, you know, in the first century AD. So you can't dispute their age. You can't dispute their antiquity. Um, we absolutely know that these were, you know, physically written in some cases when Jesus was alive. And so they, uh, they give us, as I said, a special portrait into uh, the thought and the life and, and, and how uh, Jewish contemporaries of our Lord viewed the world and then when we compare that with the Gospels and the Epistles, uh, a lot of details that we otherwise wouldn't notice or would not know what to do with suddenly come to life and, uh, you know, take on color because we realize, oh, this little, inc this little detail or this little incident uh, 
from the Gospels actually has meaning in the culture of those days. Thank you. So in the introduction, you actually point out how scholars date the Gospel of John to be the latest gospel, mainly because of the language John uses to describe Jesus and the picture that he paints of Jesus. But with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that these things are well grounded within Judaism at the time. What are a few uh, strong examples of that? And do you think that John actually may be one of the earlier gospels, considering he knows things about the geography of Jerusalem, for example, that the other writers don't know or maybe they just don't mention and he knows certain things about um just certain he makes certain nuanced points about uh judaic practices at the time that seems to indicate he had uh good sources and maybe was writing pretty early on right so um yeah i do think that there's reason to believe that john um uh assumes that you know one or more of the other gospels uh, so I do see him. I do see John. I, I believe the apostle wrote the gospel, and um, there's been defenses of apostolic authorship uh, written relatively recently within the past few years. For example, uh, the internationally famous uh, Methodist scholar Paul N. Anderson uh, wrote like a 75-page defense that he delivered at an international scholarly conference on um, you know, John the Apostle's authorship of the Gospel of John as being the best explanation for the book. And I accept Anderson's arguments. But um, uh, getting back to this, um, John uh, certainly gives evidence of having been written by someone who was very familiar with Jewish culture and specifically the Jerusalem region and Judea more generally, okay? prior to the destruction of the temple in the year 70. That was a hard break in, in the year 70, and that whole area was decimated and uh, destroyed, burned to the ground, not only in Jerusalem, but outlying cities as well. So there was huge cultural destruction. And after the year 70, it was hard to reconstruct how things uh, had actually been. But the Gospel of John is clearly written by somebody who knew what life was like and what the culture was like and throws in little details um, that uh, that would not have been known. For example, um, in John 5, we have the healing of the man who was laying beside the pools of Bethesda. And John remarks that there were five porticos in that place. Uh, we have later in, in the 1950s, we dug that up and found that there were two pools side by side and there was one, two, three, four porticos that formed a perimeter around those two pools, and then a portico down the middle between the two pools. Um, so that was an unexpected confirmation of this little remark that, uh, you know, the five porticos of the pools of Bethesda. Uh, and again, that was destroyed in the year 70, so nobody would have known that. Now, when it comes to the language, you know, this is one of the things that was that was noticed very early on in the study of the scrolls. And some of the first scholars to get access to the scrolls remarked on this, that in the Gospel of John, certain terminology, um, like things like sons of light and spirit of truth, and uh, this characteristic in the Gospel of John that's often referred to as dualism, where, where John will express a sharp contrast between, say, sons of light and sons of darkness, or spirit of truth and spirit of falsehood. That, that kind of phraseology was attributed by uh, a German scholar by the name of Rudolf Bultmann and others. Uh, he attributed that to late developments of Platonic philosophy that only arose in the second and third generation of the Christian era, and that were really too late to be reflected in the first century already. And so Boltman concluded that the Gospel of John was written, you know, in the 100s or even as late as the 200s uh, AD, too late to really reflect a living memory of Jesus. Then the scrolls were discovered and we found this, this phrase, for example, sons of light, uh, occurs numerous places in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Also the term spirit of truth, you know, 
uh, several times in the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially in the community rule, which was the central document of the monastic group that, uh, that uh, lived on the shores of the Dead Sea. And, and many other examples as well, and they, they've been cataloged by other scholars, but suddenly this, this language that was thought to represent some late development was discovered to be, you know, authentically Jewish. And uh, some of the documents in which this language is found were up to 100 years before uh, the birth of our Lord. So we're talking 100 BC, for example, the community rule uh, was written then. It has a lot of these phrases that are uh, that that uh, are otherwise found only in John's writings, and, and that was that was unique. Ryan was was the number of phrases that were discovered that only occur in uh, John's writings, like uh, the Gospel and especially his first epistle, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, in nowhere else in ancient literature. And so, as as many you know scholars noted, uh, this this shows us that the language of the Gospel of John truly reflects the religious jargon that flourished among Jews uh, from about 100 BC to the time of the destruction of the temple, this, this late period um, before these climactic events. You know, in other words, the, the religious Jewish, we can even say jargon of Jesus's day, you know, the, the odd terms. I mean, as Catholics, uh, you know, we have terms like, you know, total consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You know, it's, it's kind of a jargony uh, kind of a statement, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Jews had, had jargon, and, and we see that reflected in, um, in the scrolls and in the Gospel of John. So I think it really authenticates the Gospel of John as a first century uh, Jewish document. So this dualistic view, this was... Um... This was associated with Jewish apocalypticism right. before Jesus' day, though, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. You find it in the Second Temple literature as well. And really, it has roots in canonical literature. You uh, you know, the roots of dualism, some argue, are, are in the wisdom literature, for example, which contrasts, you know, the way of wisdom versus the way of folly, that there's basically just two ways to life, you know? So, Yeah. So, so why did Bolt, so I guess Boltman just, uh, he just attributed to Hellenism and thought maybe John was written later outside yeah. of Palestine somewhere. Right, right. Yeah, he attributed it to, to Greek thought, uh, specifically to a movement called Neoplatonism, mm. uh, kind of a, a revival of Plato's teaching in the second and third centuries A.D., uh, where Plato's thought was combined with also mystical streams of, of uh, Greek thought as well. So, um, and yeah, that's how Boltman viewed it. But, mm. you know, in hindsight, he didn't have any data you didn't, to, to make that argument. Uh, but he had a lot of self-confidence. And uh, when you look in the history of biblical scholarship, many of these German scholars, just once they got into a position socially in Germany, you know, you, you just don't challenge a, um, an endowed chair professor. Um, you don't question him. That's considered very rude. I saw that firsthand at conferences that were held in, in German speaking Switzerland, for example, I would object to something and, and boy, you know, uh, people booed and hissed, you know, it was like, <laughs> wow. you just, don't, you just don't do that. Mm -hmm. The problem with that though, Ryan, is that if you are such a scholar, you begin to feel that you're just, um, you know, invincible and, and beyond being questioned. And uh, you start just asserting things and, and you start believing your own, you know, your own assertions without really questioning whether uh, you have you have enough data to support what you're suggesting. So uh, that that was that was what, you know, the, the apostle, the uh, the gospel of John was a casualty of that kind of thought for about a quarter of a century. So in your book, you also um, speculate that John the Baptist may have been an Essene in his earlier life and then later broke off, which I found really convincing. And I know you're probably not the first one to argue that, but you did it well. What do you think is the strongest evidence that John was an Essene at one point? <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, and again, this is not original with me, but um, Raymond Brown, for example, a uh, very famous um, uh, commentator on the Gospel of John, um, he remarks at one point that um, everything that is said about uh, John the Baptist um, in the Gospels has some kind of resonance with uh, the Essene movement. And yeah, so to, to go right on down the line, there's so, there's so many things. First of all, there's geographic proximity. So John the Baptist is ministering um, in the lower Jordan, uh, the part of the Jordan River that connected to the province of Judea. At no point in that stretch of the Jordan River are you more than a day's walk from the monastery that is at the site at Qumran. So he was always within easy travel of uh, the monastery. We notice that when John is questioned about his identity, he appeals to Isaiah 40, verse 3. Uh, a voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, this is also the verse that the Dead Sea Scrolls appeal to when the movement that sponsored this monastery is giving an explanation of their origins. Mm. Uh, the reason why they're out in the desert is to prepare the way of the Lord. They took Isaiah 40 verse three, literally that's striking because the, the, uh, the Pharisees are not doing anything with Isaiah 40 verse three. Uh, the Sadducees are not doing anything with that verse. Um, you know, it's not very, it's not an influential passage in broader Judaism, but then you have, the monks and you have John the Baptist both making very prominent use of that verse to justify their existence. Um, then you've got the water washing connected with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now there's differences, important differences in, in the um, in the monastery at Qumran. They thought that the Holy Spirit moved through their waters and was actively forgiving their sin. John the Baptist preaches a water washing for repentance and says that the Messiah is going to bring the Holy Spirit later. That may have been an issue that led to John leaving or getting kicked out of uh, the monastery. But then a particular aspect of John's uh, ministry that seems to point to him having been expelled from the community is the fact that he's eating off the land. You have that curious statement in Mark and Matthew that he was uh, eating locusts and wild honey. Now, the historian Josephus tells us that when men were kicked out of the community, um, the, the Essene community, uh, they often starved because uh, they had taken vows not to eat food prepared outside the community. And there's a reason for that. It's because the reduction of your rations was the only form of discipline uh, that was practiced within the Essene community. And that's reflected in the community rule uh, of, uh, of Qumran, uh, that, that monastery there. And so guys that got kicked out had to eat grass or whatever they could find. They could not eat prepared foods. And that's what it appears that John the Baptist is doing. And Josephus, the Jewish historian of this time period, uh, even mentions another hermit, uh, like figure that lived a lifestyle very similar to John the Baptist named Bonus. And uh, Josephus knew this, this other hermit personally. Um, and uh, I think that both Bonus and John the Baptist may have been, uh, you know, excommunicated from the monastery. And that's why they're living, you know, off the land and just eating uh, unprepared foods that were aspects of the environment and weren't really, uh, you know, food food uh, in, in the first place. You know, then, then too, Ryan, you know, we have that curious verse in Luke 180 that John was in the desert until his appearing to Israel. And then we also have the, the curious fact that in Matthew and Mark, it said that he just appeared. It's like, well, where did he come from? He just like, <laughs> bang, there he is, you know, what's going on? But if he was raised in the monastery, that would explain why Luke 180 says that he was out there until he began his ministry. And if he was expelled from the monastery, that would explain why uh, he suddenly appears and there's no backstory. Like nobody noticed him before because he was living a secluded life. 
right out there. And so when he leaves and begins preaching, it does seem like he has just appeared. Nobody knows where he came from. Mm. He hasn't been a public figure before, but suddenly there he is. Um, you know, yeah, um, it, it provides a, a plausible backstory for why he created such a shock uh, when he began his public ministry. So there's probably some other things that I've forgotten, but I think, you know, those those elements um, alone um, help to connect John with the monastery. It's also clear that John did not come from the traditional Pharisaic uh, educational process. He is not linked to uh, to uh, a rabbi like Hillel or Gamaliel or Shammai or something like that. Um, he, he certainly is. He's practicing asceticism, which the rabbis did not. I mean, the rabbis dressed very lavishly. And here um, uh, John is, is dressing in, a, in an ascetical fashion. And that was, again, typical of the Essene movement. Um, so and he and and John has some education. I mean, he 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 appears to know the scriptures well. He preaches very confidently. Um, he's not just some kind of you know bumbling, um, uh, self-taught hillbilly. Uh, <laughs> he he seems to have facility uh, with with the scriptures. Where would he get that if he wasn't if if he didn't come through the Pharisee system? Sure. You know, well, he would have gotten there that at the monastery. So right, and I, and I think Josephus talks about him as a respected figure who indeed had quite a large following. Yes, um, and you've also argued that John the Baptist's parents, when they send him off into the wilderness, if you read it with no context, it seems kind of, <laughs> you know, kind of well, harsh. You know, you just send your son into the wilderness, but right. if they were older, right it would make sense for them to give him to this monastic community, given that the community was celibate, they didn't have children of their own. And I think it's Josephus that says that they recruited members from outside because they didn't have children. And so that, right. you know, that all, that makes sense of the story. If you look at it. Sure. That yeah, way. Josephus explicitly says they took in boys from the larger community and mm. formed them, gave them formation. He even used that term formation, which we, uh, continue to use to this day and uh so yeah it, it provides a very plausible uh you know sequence so you got elderly uh Zachary and elizabeth who send their son to be raised by the monks where he's going to get an excellent uh education because they had a first-rate library by first century standards you know over a thousand mm -hmm. volumes and uh it's yeah it's like you know it's like in the middle ages where monasteries were like you know, centers of learning, and you were happy if you could send your son to get trained there, you'd get a great education. Right. Now, if John the Baptist's father, Zachariah, if he was a priest, is it possible that he was an Essene priest living in Jerusalem? Because I know Josephus mentions that mm -hmm. the Essenes, uh, for a period of time, were allowed to offer their own sacrifices according to their own halakha. I'm not sure when exactly that is. And I know that passage is contested uh, whether they were actually offering sacrifices or not. But do you think that's possible that he was actually an Essene priest or do you think he belonged to the mainstream uh, Sadducees? Right, right, right. Great question. Um, you know, I think I think the situation on the ground in um, first century Judea was quite complicated. I think we need to think not only in terms of these three different sects that Josephus lays out, but also sympathizers mm. of folks that, um, uh, you know, maybe um, were not, um, uh, you know, as it were, fully enrolled members, but had uh, sympathies uh, for one or more of these uh, sects. Or, and, okay, so in the case of Zechariah, for example, Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's, uh, he's serving in the temple. So he is going along with, um, uh, you know, the, the, the public worship, uh, that's recognized by the authorities. And so it's unlikely that he's a fully enrolled Essene because, uh, you know, the Essenes, uh, 
um, objected to the way that the temple was being run ever since uh, the year 152, where the Ma when the Maccabees took over the high priesthood. Um, but what I think what I think probably happened, Ryan, is when uh, when the Maccabees corrupted the high priesthood in the year 152. That's when Jonathan Aphis, one of the Maccabean kings, took the title of high priest himself by political force. And it's it's widely believed that he ousted the legitimate high priest at that time. And many scholars, and I'm among them, you know, but but the but you know the the, the great scholars like Joe Fitzmeyer and Jerome Murphy O'Connor and, and others from a previous generation, Raymond Brown, uh, they all held that um, the high priest kicked out in the year 152 BC was uh, was in fact the teacher of righteousness who's referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls, who seems to be a priestly figure who had a conflict in Jerusalem and uh, and had to flee. So um, what I think happened was the priests who were serving in the temple had a choice, a very hard choice to make. Do they stay loyal to the legitimate high priest or do they stay loyal to the sacredness of the place? Mm. So it's like, what are you going to evaluate? Mm. Do you stay with the temple because it's clearly... The temple is the place which the Lord your God has chosen. You, you, you can't really dispute that that place is is has been sanctified by divine choice. So do you do you prioritize that over the purity of the high priestly line? And I think that every every priest and every Levite had to make that decision. It was a hard choice for them. Some stayed loyal to the, the true high priestly line, and, and they went into a kind of internal exile, and, and many of them, I think, went down to Qumran and, um, you know, became part of that movement, part of the Essene movement. Uh, but others, I think, decided, uh, no, uh, you know, the temple is still sacred, and, and so I'm going to stay faithful to, this, to the temple, even though my personal sympathies may lie elsewhere. And so I think that's I think that's the case with Zechariah. I don't think he was sympathetic with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, I think he recognized that there was a lot of corruption, but he himself probably had a legitimate bloodline. And he was like, I'm going to I'm going to stay faithful to my duties. I'm going to continue to serve because this is a place which which the Lord God has chosen. But in terms of his own son's education, he wanted his son to be raised by the Essenes and not by uh, the Pharisees, who are a non-priestly movement, and not by the Sadducees, who had um, corrupted themselves by uh, collaborating with the Herodians. Um, so the Essenes had at Qumran a meal, a ritualistic, messianic uh, meal that looked really similar to the Eucharist or the Last Supper. Right. What do you think inspired this meal? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, ultimately it's it's scripture that is inspiring what they're doing. I think mm -hmm. their water washing rituals were inspired by the various prophetic texts that spoke of some kind of um, coincidence of um, water washing with the gift of the spirit. And you find these frequently, um, Ezekiel 36 the sprinkling, the sprinkling of clean water that will bestow a um, a new heart and a new spirit on Israel. Um, I, Isaiah forty four that speaks of uh, pouring clean water on on a dry ground, uh, which is then interpreted as the outpouring of the spirit on the people of Israel. So that's the the water rituals that they're performing. Then you got the meal rituals, and I think that. Inspiring their me their meal rituals are texts like Isaiah 23 that promises this banquet on Mount Zion that's going to swallow up death. I think passages like Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, that talks about a, a free meal that will initiate the participants into the covenant that was enjoyed by David. Um you know th those those texts uh, and uh, and others um, <clears throat> are inspiring their practice, 
<coughs> and so what you see them doing is having this sacred ritual at noon every day where they're consuming bread and wine under the under the leadership of a priest who who prays and blesses the elements of the meal before anybody partakes and then then we find at the in in the appendix to the community rule which which we call it the rule of the congregation but it it um it gives adjustments to their ritual practice to adjust for the coming of the messiah we see that they expected to share this this ritual meal of bread and wine with the messiah when he arrived and really they expected two messiahs um again who are going to share this meal with them and so it seemed like this this uh, daily meal was um an anticipation of this end times banquet that was going to be enjoyed with uh the messiahs because they typically expected to mm -hmm. a priestly and a royal messiah uh when, when the when the end of time was ushered in you know the, the messianic age and, and when everything was restored and the kingdom of Israel was restored and, and all of that. So you can see there a lot of uh, similarities with uh, the Last Supper and uh, the early Christian Eucharist. So the Last Supper, is this a Passover meal or is this a ritualistic meal like they had at Qumran? Or, or is Jesus bringing both things together? Yeah, yeah, uh, the latter. I think he's bringing both things together because mm. definitely, definitely a Passover. And yet... The Passover didn't have uh, a, a unique blessing over, uh, you know, the bread and the cup like we see in the Gospels. That seems to be uh, a, a kind of a unique, uh, a, you know, innovation that Jesus introduces into the Passover Seder. But but when he does, I mean, you can't help if, if, if you've studied the the passages of Josephus where he describes their ritual practice. If you looked in the scrolls where they, where they again, where they describe their own uh, ritual meal, you can't help but be struck uh, by the similarity. Um, for example, in, in the scrolls, it, it's, it's emphatic that the priest has to reach out his hand first and he's got to bless the bread and the wine before anybody else partakes and we see Jesus doing that at the Last Supper. He's acting like the priest in the Essene ritual practice by blessing the elements before anybody partakes and then distributing the elements to the others. There's a strong emphasis on everybody sitting and partaking by rank in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls when they're at this ritual meal. And you, you see in Luke, for example, that a fight breaks out among the disciples about their re respective ranks in the context of the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. um, so they and, and why would that be? It's because they're trying to sit in in order there, uh, but they didn't know exactly what that was. And uh, yeah, so so I think uh, you, you have a fusion there. You've got. Yes, it is a Passover. No doubt about that. Um but Jesus is um, is introducing some innovations within the Passover liturgy, and those innovations reflect um, Jewish ritual practice, which is reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, you know, there's also indication that that very devout Pharisees also gathered into little communities where they had uh something similar this this uh ritual meal of bread and wine that that they celebrated so looks like this practice was more widespread than simply the essenes and when we when we're knowledgeable about that and then take that information to the gospel text that described the last supper we see jesus acting in this priestly liturgical fashion um and for the apostles that had been formed in Essenism before they, before they became disciples of Jesus, mm -hmm. they would have perceived, you know, they would have looked at what Jesus was doing and saying, this is what we expected the, the priestly Messiah to do, you know, right. at the end of time. And it, it's just very, very right. powerful. Absolutely. And it, I think it was Peter and his brother that were, followers of john the baptist 
before Jesus? Well, according I, to the Gospel of John. I yeah, uh, it, it uh, John chapter one indicates that Andrew uh, was a follower of John the Baptist before he becomes a disciple of Jesus, and um, Andrew is uh, hanging around with a conspicuously unmentioned second disciple in John chapter one. And there's a long tradition of understanding that this second disciple who is curiously left unnamed was actually John. Um, so John and Andrew seem to at least, at least those two seem to have been followers of John the Baptist, disciples of John the Baptist before uh, they become, um, you know, disciples of, uh, of Jesus. Uh, and I think that possibly other, you know, possibly others, there may have been one or two, you know, as many as four of the apostles may have been, may have had a background in Essenism uh, prior uh, to, um, you know, following Jesus. So, so Jesus is presiding over this meal as a priest. We know he was seen as the Davidic Messiah uh, coming from the lineage of David. Do you think Jesus also had a um, Zadokite lineage? Jesus? Cause certain, yes, because I think a certain Zadok is mentioned in his genealogy according to Matthew. And right. I, and the Essenes were expecting a kingly Messiah, a priestly Messiah. Is it also possible that Jesus is fusing these things together as well in his own person? Yeah, it's not explicit, certainly, but... Um... You know, by the nature of the case, uh, it's very reasonable to imagine that there was intermarriage between the royal and the high priestly families, uh, just because those were the two leading families uh, mm -hmm. of the nation. When you're looking back at the, the kingdom of David between, you know, uh, 1000 BC and 587. Um, so at some point in there, uh, it would not be rem uh, remarkable at all if... Um, if a woman from, you know, the high priestly family married one of the princes uh, from uh, the line of David. So we can't rule that out for sure. And we notice that the Blessed Mother is referred to as the cousin of, uh, of Elizabeth. And uh, Elizabeth is married to, obviously, Zachariah, who's a high ranking priest. Uh, so, and, and, uh, Mary is, uh, from the line of David. So there looks like, you know, there's some family connection there. Um, so it's possible, although that's, that's speculative and, uh, mm -hmm. I don't really follow that up in my book. The, the kind of priesthood that is associated with Jesus, especially when we look in, for example, the epistle to the Hebrews is not the Levite priesthood, but the Melchizedekian priesthood. And that is a that is a priesthood that was associated actually with the line of David because uh, David um, conquers and takes over uh, the city of Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 5, which Jewish tradition identified as the, uh, the holy city founded by Melchizedek in Genesis 14, where uh, Melchizedek is referred to as King of Salem, which was taken to be Jerusalem. So um, you do see, for example, that in um, the last verse of 2 Samuel 8 refers to David's sons as priests, Kohanim in Hebrew, which is the word for priest. Mm -hmm. And Psalm 110 says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that's a psalm that seems addressed by the court uh, minstrel to uh, the Davidic king. Right. So it seems like there was this Melchizedekian priesthood that was associated with the line of David. And that's what uh, the epistle uh, to the Hebrews uh, associates with Jesus, rather than attempting to argue that, uh, you know, Jesus had um, Zadokite blood, you know, back in his genealogy somewhere. Right. Uh, yeah, Margaret Barker, She. I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but she argues that there's this older priest-king tradition, you know, in the time of David that gets written out by the Deuteronomists, but survives, I guess, in certain pockets of Judaism and the diaspora. 
and it's being you know revived with the early Jesus movement. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And there's a document in the scrolls called Eleven Q Melchizedek that presents an alternate uh, eschatology in which uh, you don't get a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah. Instead, Melchizedek comes back. Mm -hmm. He's both king and priest, and he ushers in um, the end times Jubilee era. Uh, that involves the forgiveness of sins and release from bondage to Satan. Interesting. And as I show in my book, uh, the Gospel of Luke seems like it was written with that tradition in mind because um, Jesus reads from Isaiah 61 at his first sermon at Nazareth, a text that was strongly associated in the Essene movement with uh, the return of Melchizedek. Uh, and then Jesus claims to be the fulfillment of that passage. And then he follows it up by um, by freeing people from Satan through exorcisms and also even explicitly forgiving sin uh, in the following chapter. Um, so uh, the Gospel of Luke, I, I really think that the Gospel of Luke was, was partly written uh, to try to convert Essenes because uh, if, if you're looking for a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah, then Luke gives those two figures to you mm -hmm. in his opening chapters with, with John the Baptist, who has the credentials to be a priestly Messiah, and then Jesus, who's got the credentials to be a royal Messiah. But on the other hand, if you're expecting Melchizedek to come back, then Jesus is also presented to you. Uh, as a, as the eschatological Melchizedek. So whatever your eschatological preferences were, Luke shows you that, hey, you know, Jesus has all the bases covered. Whatever you were expecting, he, he was it. <laughs> right. That's interesting. So even in the Qumran community itself, there seemed to be... Diversity. Uh, diversity. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I want to read a little excerpt from your book, and then I got a follow-up question for you. On page 175, you quote from Matthew 12, where Jesus and his followers get in trouble with the Pharisees for uh, allegedly breaking the Sabbath. And you say, the two examples Jesus cites to defend his and his apostles' right to thresh the grain on the Sabbath are both priestly in nature. David and his men performing a priestly act of eating bread of presence and the priests in the temple working on the Sabbath day as a part of their priestly service. And then you quote Rabbi Jacob Neusner, who's a prominent scholar, who says, He, Jesus, and the disciples may do on the Sabbath what they do because they stand in the place of the priests in the temple. And the holy place has shifted, now being made up of the master and his disciples. Did Jesus see the temple as a typological symbol that pointed to himself and his community and did he envision a future without it um yes uh, i think i think all of the above um i think that the dead sea scrolls give us enough background that uh that we can reasonably say that you know uh, uh the historical jesus you know mm -hmm. uh as, as scholars are are want to say uh <laughs> didn't believe did indeed believe these things so um <clears throat> So yes, so you you this is a strong theme, of course, in the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter two. You have the temple cleansing scene. Jesus is challenged. What sign will you show us to uh, that you that you have the authority to do these things? Jesus says, "Destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it again." Uh, they say it's taken us forty six years to build this temple. John explains John two twenty one. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, very interestingly. Uh, several times in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the Essenes refer to themselves as a mikdash uh, ha'adam, a sanctuary of Adam or a sanctuary of humanity or of human beings. You can go, you can render it in different ways because you know, adam is kind of a polyvalent term. Um, but um, that's so interesting because uh, in the scrolls and in the New Testament, uh, both from Jesus and Paul and from other uh, old other New Testament authors uh, like uh, John and Luke, you know, you get this uh, concept of a temple composed of human beings. And you definitely have it there in uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, this is why they're only wearing linen. Um, not er- not all of their members had specifically priestly blood. They did have kind of a, a governing class that they referred to as the Zadakim or the descendants of Zadok. Um, those were guys that were priests, but they also had kind of, as it were, lay Israelites who were members, but they all dressed in linen. And, and that was the priestly cloth, you know, the, the cloth of purity. And uh, so they, they did regard themselves as a priestly community. They did regard themselves as a temple community. Um, uh, I would argue, and, and this is not original with me, but you know, m- many scholars see them as understand themselves as a replacement for the temple, mm-hmm. that their community replaces the temple. Well, if the Essenes can think like that, certainly Jesus and his disciples can think like that as well. And I think this gives, you know, provides historical context for that passage in Matthew 12. You know, Newsner is absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Um, but this idea of a community that substitutes for the temple is something that Jesus' contemporaries would grasp because mm-hmm. it was kind of out there, you know, in, in the theological discussions. And I think what Jesus is, is basically saying is, you know, yes, there's going to be a community of human beings. There is going to be a mikdash ha'adam. There's going to be a sanctuary of humanity uh, that's going to replace the temple, but it's not going to be the Essene community. It's going to be my community. It's going right. to be the, the kahal or the ecclesia that I build on Peter um, according to Matthew 16. It seems like he took things a step further than the Qumran sect did. They saw themselves as a replacement for the temple, but if I'm not mistaken, they still thought another future purified physical temple would be built, right? Yes. Yeah. Whereas, it seems, yeah. whereas mm-hmm. Jesus, he takes that idea of a community replacing the temple but it's not just temporary, it's permanent. They are the true temple, the eschatological temple, if you will. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Because not one stone is going to be left on another. He just he right. just sees the stone temple being obliterated. And then it's going to be replaced by uh, his community uh, mm. that he's established. His kahal or his ecclesia, his church, if you will. Um is going to be that new sanctuary and that that um that idea of the church as the temple uh, is very strong in parts of paul notably ephesians Mm -hmm. and then uh in a different form in a more pictorial form it's uh, definitely present in um the book of revelation in the final several chapters have this fusion of the community with the city and the temple Right. Yes. Yeah. Paul's examples are powerful because he's I think when he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, don't you know that you are the temple of God? And he quotes right. Ezekiel, which who who is speaking of the eschatological end times, you know, restored uh-huh. temple. And he's applying it to living believers in Corinth. It's a, a amazing passage. Yes. So. So as far as I know, it's just the Jesus movement and the Dead Sea Scroll movement that were willing to see a replacement to the temple. Is that right? We don't really see this anywhere else in Judaism, do we? No, no. Unless, uh, unless you think of the Samaritans who had their own temple on Mount Gerizim. um, And, uh, you know, I think it would be improper to call them uh, Jewish or Judaizers. They referred to themselves as Israelites. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, that's that is an interesting connection because the Essene movement likewise referred to themselves as Israelites, not as Judeans. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, but yeah, so the Essenes and the early Christian movement are willing to see a a replacement of the stone temple with a human community, whereas mainstream Judaism as well as the Samaritans remain uh, committed to a physical structure uh, on a particular mountain. Got one more question because I know you got to go. So as both a believing Catholic and and a scholar, a historian, how do you see Jesus coming to his, um, his vocational understanding? Like, do you think he is receiving 
uh, from God what to say, what to do, what to think? Or do you think he's looking at the Judaism of his day? He's conversing with John the Baptist and his followers who come from this Essene background, and he's kind of forming his own uh, understanding of what he's supposed to do as the Messiah. Does that question make sense? Um, I think or, or, so. or is it both? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the 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 interior consciousness of uh, Jesus is, um, you know, something that a lot of people have speculated on, um, but we're not really given access to. Um, so, you know, our Lord never says or is never recorded anywhere in the Gospels as explaining what it was like to grow up as a 12 year old who's also got a divine nature uh mm -hmm. something of, of this fashion but um uh I, i'm trying to think what would be what would be helpful to say about this um the gospels do do present do describe jesus as being cognizant from a young age of his unique calling by God. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very clear in the infancy narratives of Luke, you know, and say the, say the finding the boy Jesus in the temple. Um, so he has a unique understanding of a unique role for himself and also a peculiar relationship with uh, God, the father that, that only he has. Um, at the same time, um, we see uh, Jesus praying for discernment at different times in his ministry, um, you know, notably uh, near the end of Mark one, um, he goes off very early in the morning to pray. So, um, you know, it's a mystery of how, you know, you have one person with two natures and it's, um, it, it seems clear from the gospels that um, on the one hand, our Lord was conscious of his unique role and, uh, uh, and had a unique relationship with the father and there was communication going on and yet it was still necessary for jesus to pray mm -hmm. and he sets aside generous times of prayer which seemed to be seemed to involve the discernment of the father's will for him um, he prays at crucial moments in his ministry uh, apparently with the desire to uh, to achieve clarity about his uh, his mission so um so, you know, as I tell my students, it, in the incarnation, uh, the second person of the Trinity um, accepts certain limitations of human nature and, and seems to voluntarily submit himself to those and um, is uh, uh, unwilling uh, to use, as it were, his divine nature uh, to somehow um, perform party tricks that would excuse him from full participation in the human condition. So that seems to be part of the message of the temptation where he refuses to change stones to bread. That is to say, take advantage of uh, his divinity in order to excuse himself from the experience of the sufferings of the human condition. And, and that is kind of that is mysterious. And, it, you know, I don't think that we're going to understand on this on this side of reality uh, exactly what it was like to, you know, be the son of God and the son of man at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but you do see those both uh, playing out. Um, uh, I would object both to a characteristic characterization of Jesus that has him kind of ignorant of who he is and what he's supposed to do until he has some kind of eureka moment at the baptism. Mm. Uh, I think that's, that is far too low a Christology. Um, I think he's, he's conscious of his unique relationship with God and his unique position, position as a Messiah from his childhood. But according to his intellect, as his intellect grows in, in a natural human way, um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I would I would object to Christologies that, um, you know, have Jesus just kind of downloading information from his divine nature um, that uh, that that render prayer unnecessary uh, or or render the exercise of his reason 
as unnecessary. You know, he he submits to those, you know, to those realities, having to pray for discernment, having to think about, you know, the realities around him. But I think that that Jesus looked at the Essene movement and knew that they were on the right track in mm. many ways, um, but also were uh, wrong about certain things. And um, one of those things is the proper role of the ceremonial law. Uh, for example, um, at one point in his ministry, uh, you know, Jesus famously says, would not all of you uh, release your animal uh, from a pit or, or get your get your animal out of a pit on the Sabbath day. And uh, so should not, you know, a human being be healed on the Sabbath. Well, interestingly, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find a regulation that no, uh, you are not permitted within the Essene movement to get your animal out of a pit on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees allowed that, the Essenes prohibited it. So in that gospel passage, you see that Jesus was not addressing Essenes in that, in that situation. And that he also differed with them about how the what what the role of the ceremonial law was uh, within um, uh, within God's plan, and mm -hmm. so he's got important similarities, but also you know some serious differences. And so Essenes who wanted to convert and wanted to follow Jesus would have to swallow hard and give up on their fixation with uh, the the ceremonial law, which many of them considered to be as important as as we would classify natural law or um, you know foundational moral principles. So certain books like uh, the Book of Jubilees, which is very popular among the Essenes, really puts the ceremonies that Moses instituted on par with uh, fundamental creational moral principles. And not even the Pharisees did that. You know the, mm. the, the Pharisees in modern Judaism recognize a hierarchy. Um, again, recognize a hierarchy of um, of uh, halakhic weight of of um, of, uh, of interpretive weight within the law, so that principles of you know preservation of life uh, take priority over ritual observance. Um, and uh, and the, the Essenes sometimes did not even make those distinctions. They just put, you know, everything was, you know, everything from not eating fruit bats and abstaining from pork to uh, loving your neighbor as yourself were kind of all on the same level and all written into the fabric of creation in, in their worldview. Before you go, do you have any books or anything coming up that you want to promote? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I do have some books coming out, some books on marriage. I have a popular book on marriage coming out called Love Basics for Catholics um, from Ave Maria Press. That's going to follow the theme of marriage from Genesis to Revelation uh, using stick figures. This is uh, you know, a popular book. I've done mm -hmm. many stick figure books. Um, on a more scholarly level, um, there's a book uh, called The Two Shall Become One Flesh coming out from Baker um, Academic, uh, which is a biblical theology of the sacrament of matrimony. Uh, so uh, kind of a meatier uh, volume, more technical for clergy and uh, other scholars. Uh, so that's, uh, that's coming out. Um, I've got a book on the, on, on the Pentateuch coming out, the books of Moses uh, called Murmuring Against Moses. Uh, the contentious past and contest contested future of Pentateuchal studies. It's a book I co-wrote with a friend of mine, uh, scholar Dr. Jeff Morrow from Seton Hall University, and um, we take a look at the history of the scholarship on the books of Moses and make some new proposals. So there's some a lot of things in the works, um, okay. and uh, yeah. Are you, are you are you guys arguing for mosaic authorship? We're leaving that door open for sure. Uh, we're arguing that it's that it's uh, the Pentateuch is older um, and more unified than uh, scholars uh, would give it credit for. Um, but in our arguments in the book, we're staying within the bounds of what we can what we can argue historically. Sure. Awesome. I'll definitely check it out. I'm studying at Hebrew Union College right now, which is Reformed Jewish school. And my Hebrew Bible professor, he um, 
I think the documentary hypothesis is even too conservative for him. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I'll definitely check that out. <laughs> definitely. Dr. Yeah. Bergsman, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Ryan. It's been a pleasure. Uh, have you. a blessed night. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.